And welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Global Connections. And today we're going to talk about um, whether and to the extent it's time to watch for the growth of Southeast Asia. Where is it going in today's geopolitical and very complex world? With Carl Baker, Senior Advisor to Pacific Forum. Welcome to the show, Carl. Good to be back, Jay. Always fun to talk about Southeast Asia, a place that I've been spending more time in than uh, recent years. So it's uh, it's an exciting region. It's a it's a it's a growing region. There's still a lot of kids that are running around the streets in Southeast Asia, and so it's uh, it's it's somewhat refreshing, you know, when you when you see the dynamism that that's going on in in the area. Yeah, well, and, you know, it's interesting that. Um, we don't talk enough about Southeast Asia because it's a, it's a, a juggernaut of activity and possibility. And um, I think uh, one thing that has to be said is that China is the capstone of Southeast Asia, geographically, economically, physically. Uh, and uh, so much happens in Southeast Asia that depends on what China is going to do as an attempt to deal with China. It's an expression of the, the relationship of these countries and leaders with China, which is, you know, actually it hangs over them in the sense that I think they'd be doing more and better if China wasn't such, um, you know, a, a depressing effect on the individual countries. Um, do you agree? Oh, I, I depends on whose perspective you're looking at it from. I think from Southeast Asia perspective, they don't see it as as being a depressing effect as much as they see it as being a very economically dependent effect. And so, you know, the the, the people in Southeast Asia see, see China as the economic engine and it, the stop, full stop right there. They don't, they, yeah, security is a problem, but we have the United States as sort of that security guarantor in the region. And we're pretty comfortable that we can manage to play China and the U.S., off against each other to some extent, but we really think that China is an important economic driver. And, and that's Southeast Asia perspective, I think. And, and it's across the board, not, not just one or two of the countries, but I think all the countries recognize that they need China for the, for the economic engine. Now, the United States is trying to, to, trying, to rec trying to fix that as far as the United States is concerned with the, with the Indo-Pacific economic framework. Uh, but it, the, the Southeast Asian states are pretty committed to their trading relationship with with China first, and the rest of the world takes a second second seat to that. Well, let's look at the map and identify what's where and what's who, and and you know sort of rank them in terms of their progress and their mm -hmm. potential. Um, so in this map, you know there are various countries, and we should identify which one which ones are um, the ones that count, the ones that are really in Southeast Asia. Because mm -hmm. I think sometimes we confuse who the members are. Um, and, and for that matter, the parameters by which we judge them to be members. So let's look at the map. Yeah. So, I mean, when you, when you look at the map, I mean, you know, Southeast Asia is somewhat arbitrary, how we define what's in Southeast Asia. But if you look at, at it, there's 10, there's 10 countries in the ASEAN ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asia Nations, ASEAN, uh -huh. 10, 10 countries with obviously the big lead, Indonesia, the largest population by, by multiples. Uh, next, you have Malaysia, the Philippines, Singapore, and then you get to continental Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Thailand, Cambodia, uh, Laos, Myanmar, and then finally, Brunei, which is uh, a, a little sliver off Malaysia there, and so those are the ten. Those are the ten countries that are normally considered Southeast Asia. Obviously, there's there's interactions with China, as you can see, because it's the big the big brother to the north. And there's also interactions with with Taiwan. Taiwan has a lot of of industries that have have branched out into Southeast Asia. But pr primarily, what, what has been the growth engine for Southeast Asia is building components being shipped to China. And, and they are by far the largest trade partner for all the countries in the region, and certainly for the region overall. There's been a free trade agreement between China and Southeast Asia since the 90s. 
there's the there's the the regional cooperative cooperative cooperate cooperation economic initiative RCEP, which has been in place which is again the northeast asia countries china south korea japan along with southeast asia and australia as well, australia and new zealand as well and then there's there's also the the comprehensive and uh, comprehensive and progressive trans pacific partnership which of course was uh, started by New Zealand and the United States, and then ultimately some of the Southeast Asia countries participated in that free trade agreement, and they are still part of that. Of course, the United States withdrew. And then finally, you have the, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, which includes seven of the Southeast Asia countries. The ones that aren't included are Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar. All the others are part of that IPEF that the United States has been working on, which is not really a trade agreement as much as it is a, a rules of the road for economic engagement agreement that is making some progress on supply chain resilience and, and green energy and uh, things like that. The trade pillar of that particular agreement has not gone very far, mostly because the United States has continued to maintain its position that it won't accept any any uh, uh, in any any trade that that trade favors as part of it. So it, there's no trade concessions by the United States to give market access to the U S market. So that pillar has not moved very far in the in the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, which is being led by the United States. Would you say that uh, Southeast Asia, and maybe it's just, you know, you can't lump them together, really, in terms of um, where, where they're all going, because they're different. And, I, and I've and i asked you before in other shows uh, whether there, 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 there will come a time when they all get together and be closer politically, geopolitically. And, and the answer to that is? The answer is probably not. It's a consensus. It's a consensus-based organization. There's... As you as you can see, there's there's countries in there that are are large, Indonesia over 200 million people, and Brunei, which you know is a couple million, and so you know Singapore a couple million. So you know so the so the the numbers are vastly different. Religions are different. Uh, economic positions are much different. Uh, Singapore is is as much of a, a, a leading economic economy uh, than uh, it's a leading economy versus versus a place like Laos, which is very rural, very underdeveloped. Myanmar, of course, which has, uh, has is going through a, a, a revolution right now. It's uh, run by a, a military junta, you know? And so there's a lot of different political systems. Vietnam is, is a completely communist country where Indonesia just had its latest election, fairly successful. Philippines, of course, is, has always been a, a democracy in some, in some people's minds too democratic and has, has had problems because of that, because of the because of the open open press and all that. So, but vastly different uh, economies, vastly different political systems, and you know they they try very hard to work on consensus. But of course, the downside of consensus is that it takes a long time to get agreement on something, and when you do get agreement, it tends to be a very very bland, very anodyne sort of agreement that everybody can say yes to, but everybody also can use to their own benefit. And the common denominator is China and to a certain extent, the United States. And I yeah. read recently that, um, you know, Australia wants to get more involved in trade. Australia, um, you know, uh, allocated something like $2 billion to encourage trade with Southeast Asia. So, you know, they're on board, too, and you have these competing countries that want to open those markets. Uh, can you talk about that? Yeah. I mean, first of all, the, 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 big, the big other player is Japan. You know, Japan, ah. Japan has actually done more infrastructure development in Southeast Asia than China by far. And, and so Japan is the other big factor. They're the ones that have have a lot of economic activity. They have, like I said, they've built a lot of infrastructure in the region. They are the go-to people for looking for support for maritime security. They've they've built up the coast guards in several of the countries that 
all the all the countries in Southeast Asia speak favorably of the of the security cooperation with Japan. Probably primarily because the security cooperation with Japan is very focused on building local capacity, where the United States tends to be more military to military engagement. But increasingly, Southeast Asia sees that as as a hedge against China. So Japan is certainly the bigger bigger player. Australia, economically, not so much. Australia. Ha has certainly has a reputation for trying to engage Southeast Asia. It sees Southeast Asia as important, but it's really more on a basis of security rather than just pure economics. Because in some yeah. ways, uh, Australia competes with Southeast Asia for natural resources going into, into China and Northeast Asia more generally. Yeah, and, and Australia is to some extent driven by its relationship with, with the U.S. in a certain right. way. It's a kind of a proxy of the U.S., isn't it? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, you know, somewhat disparagingly, people used to talk about Australia as the America's deputy sheriff in the region. And <laughs> Australians don't take very kindly to that sort of characterization. <laughs> but you know, there there's some some element of, of truth that they've they've been very much a a security partner of the United States, and and also they've they've also been a very strong security partner with the uh, with the Philippines. You know, again, which plays into into that characterization that they're very much a, a partner with the United States, because of course the United States has the strong uh, security partnership with the Philippines, which under the current Marcos administration has certainly grown. Uh, you know, prior prior to Marcos, uh, pr pr President Duterte had tried to establish a relationship with China, and was largely unsuccessful. You know, he had made sort of big promises about all the economic benefits that they were going to get from cooperating with China on infrastructure. And quite honestly, China sort of dropped the ball and didn't deliver all the money that the, the Philippines thought they were going to get out of China. And so a lot of those big infrastructure projects have gone by the wayside. But uh, today, you know, the Philippines is working very closely with Japan to improve its public transportation, which if you have been to Manila lately, you understand that that is a big problem. And, and Indonesia, the same way. Indonesia has, you know, a, probably a little different story where Japan and China have competed in Indonesia to build infrastructure. And, and China was successful in building a high-speed rail network uh, in, on, on Java, which is the main, the main island where, where the largest amount of population is. But Japan has also been involved with, uh, with building, building infrastructure in, in Jakarta and and the rest of Indonesia, so there's a little bit of a competition between China and and Japan in in specifically Indonesia, and certainly in in Vietnam, uh, Japan has been very active, and even even in Myanmar, where you know the United States is very much withdrawn and is 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 uh, has put a lot of sanctions on Myanmar, and Japan is still there. They're still engaged economically in in Myanmar, trying to trying to maintain some. Some level of engagement during the current uh, junta era in in Myanmar. Yeah, I really have to admire Japan for their soft power, their trade power. Mm -hmm. um, they do they do better. They do better than we do in so many ways. But let's talk about security. You've touched on that a couple of times here, and uh, I keep thinking of the Sierra Madre, um, which was a supply ship. That was, um, you know, supplying a uh, Filipino outpost in the islands there. In the what, no, South Sierra, China Sierra Madre is no Sierra Madre. Sorry, sorry, Jay. Sierra Madre is the ship that they grounded on Second Thomas Shoal, and they've been trying to resupply that. That's that's their claim for some. Oh yes, Sierra, right. Sierra Madre itself is the ship that sits out, sits out on the sandbar, and right. they're trying to resupply the Sierra Madre. Yeah, it's so, a strange so, arrangement. Yeah. They put yeah. a ship out there as a yeah. piece of their sovereignty. Yes. And and uh, the Filipinos were trying to resupply the mm, the grounded ship Sierra Madre. Yes, uh, so but that you know that's been a bone of contention. And uh, through 2022 and 2023, there were all these incidents um, with the Chinese, with the Chinese Coast Guard, which uh, I must say is um, you know is is it's not like the American Coast Guard. It's not out there to save lives. It's out there to establish domain and sovereignty for China. Um, it's out there to, uh, to to get in the way of other ships, uh, to uh, establish territoriality 
and sometimes to ram other ships, which it did with uh, some of the ships from the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Um, really aggressive stuff and not admirable. Also, you know, China has refused to accept the International Court for, of the UN in its determination of, of the, uh, the domain over the South China Sea. And uh, I understand that uh, the Filipinos are going to go try another case in The Hague uh, on similar grounds that the Chinese are outside the, their, their legal parameters in the South China Sea. But meanwhile, you know, it's very contentious, and it's uh, it's not close to violence. It is violence, and the Chinese keep doing it. You know, I mean, there are, there are commentators who believe that um, the Filipinos are winning this contention, but in fact, the Chinese have not paid attention to that. The Chinese keep on pushing them around in the South China Sea, them and others. It's not just the Philippines. Um, so, can you comment on what's going on there and where it's all going? Yeah, I mean it's 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 complicated for sure. Uh, first of all, let's let's be clear that that the basis for all this activity is the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea. It's not it's not being driven by the by the courts or, or by by the international court. It's being driven by tribunals based on UNCLOS, and and so that's that's the basis. And of course. You know the the immediate reaction you get from everybody is yeah the United States talks about it but it hasn't signed on clause yet and mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. uh, just just as a as a sort of rub in the face you know before the Americans get too too pious about uh, international law let's understand the United States hasn't signed it and to his to his credit Deputy Secretary Campbell who in his confirmation hearing said yes it really is important that the United States should sign UNCLOS so that it was better grounded in its criticism of people who don't abide by UNCLOS rules. Just to, to make, make okay, it thank you, thank for, you for that. But I, I think that's an Americans, ongoing but, matter. We, but, we, but, we haven't finished yeah. with that, and the Filipinos haven't finished with it, and China keeps ignoring it. Yeah. Yes, and so to, on to on to the rest of your story. Yeah, the United States, or I'm sorry, China has been very aggressive, not only with the Philippines, with, with Vietnam as well. I mean, don't forget, Vietnam still claims the Paracel Islands, where, the, where China has now built an administrative headquarters. So it has, it has completely taken over the Paracel Islands. There's no, there's no doubt that the, the Vietnamese have just accepted that. But in the meantime, uh, they've, also, they've also intruded into Indonesian waters up, up around Natuna, if you go back and look at your map there in the very far south of the South China Sea, they've also uh, confronted the Indonesians. And the Indonesians have been much more aggressive in some ways because they've simply have taken those fishing boats and burnt them up. I mean, they have, they have literally burnt Chinese fishing vessels. And they've also been very, very uh, aggressive with the Chinese trying to patrol areas where uh, there are there are gas fields up, up in the Natuna area. So so the Indonesians have also felt the felt the the uh, aggressiveness of the Chinese uh, maritime fleets. And you know that's the other thing. It's not just the Coast Guard. It's also these these maritime militia boats, which really have no purpose other than to support uh, Chinese claims in that area. And what and basically the way it works is China pays these these boats to go out there as nominally as fishing boats but in fact they're they're really military militia who are used to to make claims of chinese sovereignty in in that whole region of of the south china sea so yeah china has been very aggressive and and actually what's happened since the marcos administration is the marcos administration has very much sided with made made a commitment to its alliance with the united states it's it's increased its defense cooperation and I think that it sees this as a way to be more aggressive against the Chinese intrusions in the region. And that's why you see more in the Western media these days about the confrontation between the Philippines and China, because, because the Philippines has taken the position that we are going to take a stand, we are going to, we are going to fight back to these, these aggressive actions by, by the Chinese in these areas. And, and what the Chinese are doing is they'll swarm a bunch of boats and, and sort of try to intimidate the Filipinos. And the Filipinos have actually responded by, by saying, we're not going to be intimidated. We're going to continue to build 
on these islands. And so they've improved their runway on the one on the one runway they have in the region. The Vietnamese have also done a lot of work on their islands where they've improved the infrastructure on their on their claims in that region. So everybody is engaged in this in this capacity building out in these uh, you know land features in the South China Sea. And and certainly well, and more than before. More than before. I mean they, they seem to be coming together and uh resisting the Chinese aggression more than they were. And and I'm yeah. I'm wondering why that is. Are they are they coming together? Are they having meetings? Are they deciding they need to collaborate? Is the United States involved in in uh, incentivizing that collaboration? Well certainly the United States is encouraging it. I I, I don't know how much actual collaboration is going on. There's talk about the Philippines has talked about that ASEAN should develop its own uh, convention in that in that area or their their own code of conduct that that would help ASEAN the ASEAN states better resist China. But there's not a lot of agreement there. You know, this goes back to this whole problem with consensus. Is even the maritime states in Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam have differences on what they think should and should not be done vis-a-vis -vis China in the maritime spaces. And then, of course, you have the land-based countries, Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar, which are very much influenced by China, which prevents any larger ASEAN uh, commitment to, to confronting China in a meaningful way in the maritime space. So there's, there's hints of it. Certainly, the Americans aren't discouraging that level of cooperation. But it, it, it the United States is somewhat limited in what it can do to facilitate that beyond, you know, build capacity for the Coast Guards, build build some resilience in the in the naval forces, conduct exercises and things like that. And, and, Boy, and it's uh, doing big that. exercises. Sama Sama, wasn't it last year? Huge big exercise organized by the U.S. Um, you know, unprecedented in scope and scale. Um, it's it's very interesting how the U.S. is is bringing them together through these military exercises. Well, but China has also done uh, China ASEAN exercises. I mean, this is sort of the way ASEAN is: is that uh, if if we do it with the one, we're going to do something with the other, because because ultimately their interest is to protect their capacity to act independently of, by each country. So you know, so so ASEAN isn't isn't a multilateral organization in the sense that the, for example, European Union is you know there's no there's no big headquarters that that puts out directions that individual states have to follow it's all bottoms up in ASEAN so everything has to be done by consensus and so you know so so in in ASEAN you always have this 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 movement at the local level but it's all kind of designed to protect national interests first and regional interests second mm -hmm. even yeah. even in the context of of a, a somewhat belligerent China in that region. The, the, the regional organization is always trying to facilitate national interests first and, and regional interests second. In that regard, you mentioned oil and gas uh, in the South China Sea. I guess that's the south part of the South China Sea or the southwest part. And, and we have what? Indonesian. You know, um, Hawaiian Electric gets its uh, low sulfur oil from Indonesia. That's a source for mm -hmm. our, uh, you know, generating power here. And I, I think you mentioned that Vietnam also had uh, some oil and gas offshore. How does that play into this? Because the, the Chinese have tried to interfere with that, but both of those country, the countries have resisted it, and they are, in fact, taking oil and gas from the South China Sea. How does that play for their economies? How does that play for the defense uh, issue? Well, all the all the all the littoral states have have gas and oil extraction operations in the South China Sea. The you know the the Chinese have tried to do cooperative agreements with with the, some of the individual states. For example, the Philippines back in the early two thousands, there was an agreement to to do joint exploration, which ultimately failed because China demanded that the Philippines recognize Chinese sovereignty. If they were going to do that, and so so it, it ultimately failed. But even even Malaysia and Brunei have have gas exploration, gas op, gas extraction operations in in their claimed areas in the South China Sea. And and uh, China 
hasn't really aggressively stopped the existing operations. What what you're referring to, I think, is when they when they they moved one of their exploration drills into Vietnamese territory. Then they became aggressive when the, when the Vietnamese re- tried to tried to get them to move that that exploration uh, derrick out of there. But you know, but but they they haven't really tried to force these people to stop doing their exploration in in their coastal waters. They 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 they, they make sovereignty claims, but they haven't really tried to enforce those sovereignty claims as much as they have with especially with the fishing, where they they have moved fishermen in and tried to extract uh, marine resources. For, for for the for the fishing, but what I get is this kind of manifest destiny mindset from China. They want to take uh, you know on historical claims, they want to take as much to- territory as they can in the south, in and around the South China Sea. I, I guess that's not a big change, but the change seems to me would be that the the neighboring countries uh, in Southeast Asia are actually pushing back a little bit, and so you know there's a dynamic going on. At the same time, you know, I think China is always going to be busy trying to push the envelope, always testing. You know, for example, we had a show not too long ago about Fiji and um, the Chinese presence in Fiji. They're all over the place in Fiji. Well, who would have thought this is like World War II island hopping, not from the east to the west, but from the west to the east, uh, <laughs> trying to get as much presence in as many islands uh, you know, in the Pacific, they possibly can. And, and of course, you can connect the dots or connect the islands, as the case may be. And it just looks like they're moving east. Am I right? Well, I mean, that's very much an American mindset, is that is that the, the Chinese are doing this for security purposes, that the, the ultimate goal is what? To invade Hawaii? Uh, you know, I mean, I, I, to me, I, I, I have to take a, a little bit of exception to to that sort of characterization. Certainly, they want to maintain economic uh, engagement in the Pacific Islands. Now, we're moving beyond Southeast Asia and into the Pacific, but I think it's mostly for uh, extraction of resources again, you know, where they see uh, very much a benefit uh, to their benefit to engage these blue economy countries in, in the Pacific Islands. I mean, if you, if you have to feed uh, a over a billion people, and they like to eat fish. You know, it makes sense to go where the fish are, and so I think I think it makes economic sense for for China to try to exploit its relationship with those countries to to be able to go in and extract uh, uh, marine resources from those areas. I don't think I don't think it it means that they're island hopping, trying to control territory as as an expansion of empire i think it's more of a more of being driven by by economic mm-hmm. realities mm-hmm. that china needs to continue to to find new fishing areas and yeah, and, I, I yeah we are they, they they are definitely they they have exploited over exploited the the south china sea just like all the other countries have with with over exploited the fishing fishing uh resources in in that area. So I, I think it's natural that they go and look in the Pacific to to maintain a relationship with the country, so for economic reasons. I want to move back to um, the area around Thailand, mm-hmm. uh, which we haven't talked about, you know, all that much. Um, when I think of Thailand, I think of the Mekong. When I think of the Mekong, I think of the environment. And when I think of the Mekong and the environment, I think of degradation. Um, and I think of climate change, um, environmental degradation. Qu- query whether the countries, the members of uh, you know, these organizations in Southeast Asia are doing anything, are conscious about climate change and environmental preservation. Are they? Well, yes, they are, but they're not doing a very good job. Uh, you know, and certainly the Mekong, the Mekong is the lifeblood of continental Southeast Asia. And yes, there is a big problem with damming the upper regions of, of the Mekong, which is choking off uh, resources in, in Vietnam and Thailand. So it, it is a big problem. And, you know, and the, the Chinese, you know, typically have uh, taken that and they've, they've developed the, what's called the Lansong Mekong Cooperation uh, Arrangement, you know, and, and it has very much dominated that, that area. There's, there's the old Mekong, Mekong region 
Commission, which is run by the Southeast Asians, and the Chinese have come in and they've simply over overtaken that initiative with their with their Lansang Mekong initiative, and and they are now trying to control those resources. For a while, there was a a cooperative agreement between China and the and the Mekong regions to patrol the Mekong, which which fell apart because the Chinese tried to dominate it and and tried to tried to control access to the Mekong with with the countries that the Mekong runs through. You know, so so yeah, it's a big problem for them. And and they've tried to talk about conservation efforts. The United States has developed a couple different initiatives with the Mekong region. I, I think somewhat unsuccessfully, you know, it's uh, we we've started and stopped and you know it kind of depends on which administration is in office it how much money we put against it. And so, you know, the, the Mekong region has has suffered. I think our relationship with the Mekong countries have suffered a little bit for that. Uh, you know, but uh, certainly they're they're trying to maintain the Mekong and and, the, and just river river uh, resources in general. And uh, it's been a real struggle because there hasn't been a full commitment, a regional commitment. And so you've got Laos, you know, letting the Chinese build river 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 dams, and and uh, the the lower regions suffer. Yeah, speaking of Laos um, and Cambodia. Um, there was a very interesting play at Manoa Valley Theater last year um, involving the Cambodian rock band, which was just a, an entry point to understand, you know, what has happened in Cambodia, the killing fields and the like, and, and what is happening there now and what kind of, you know, level of development they have, what kind of westernization, if you will. And um, I, I, I walk away, maybe it's my mindset problem, I walk away thinking a lot of these countries are really not westernized, um, and they're not really democracies, uh, and they have baggage like Cambodia does that they haven't really overcome. And they're rural, as you said. A lot of these places are quite rural, living in the 19th century. And so query, you know, how is that going to work out? I think there's an uneven level of development um, mm -hmm. between some of the countries. I mean, I've, I've been to Bangkok. It's a modern city. There's you know, this huge rail program and so, you know, up-to-date shopping centers on everything. Um, but if you go to some of these other places, it's, it's really country and it's way back. So uh, do you agree with me that there's an uneven level of development and some of these places are really not developed and are not likely to develop? Yeah, I, I sure. That's, you're absolutely right, that there is a huge, huge disparity in, in levels of development. And you mentioned Cambodia and Laos. And, and Myanmar, and those are the three that, you know, are really, really behind. Now, Cambodia, you know, remarkably, as much as, as much animosity as there is between, you know, Cambodia and the United States, uh, actually, the Cambodians are, are very westernized. And, you know, the, the current, the current uh, prime minister, the, the son of, of uh, uh, Hun Sen, you know, is, uh, is actually educated at the U.S. military academy. So, so Hun Manet is is a, a, a former graduate of a U.S. military academy, and they've they've done a, even the United States has done a lot of work with Cambodia, but Cambodia has also been very influenced by the Chinese. You know, the Chinese moved in, built a bunch of a uh, bunch of infrastructure, and uh, have have corrupted Sahanakville probably to forever. Uh, you know, but they but they put in a lot of capital, and they've, they've built a lot of uh, tourist facilities uh, in in Cambodia, and uh, they they're building a, apparently a navy, some kind of a navy shipyard uh, in in the in Cambodia. So they've 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 had a lot of influence, and and in Cambodia has in some ways carried China's water in in the ASEAN meetings. You know, back in 2012, famously the uh, the Cambodians refuse to uh, refuse to to acknowledge uh, a culpability on the part of China in the South China Sea, and it ended up uh, that there was no joint agreement at an ASEAN meeting. Which for ASEAN that was a big deal, and it was because the Cambodians were very deferential to the Chinese, and you know, and that that certainly sparked a big disagreement between Cambodia and the United States and the United States has kind of used that as a as a benchmark for for their willingness to work with Cambodia you know but yeah the the, the economies are certainly vastly different 
in terms of, of the, the, the amount of development, the amount of exports that they have, the amount of rural rural electrification. You know, when you go into Laos and Cambodia, there's still some large swaths of the country that aren't, aren't electrified. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it um, seems to me that some of these other countries in the area would, would be interested in um, tourism into Southeast Asia, including the rural places. And in um, you know developing businesses, I mean, for example, I I have a friend in Singapore, and um, you know he's into agricultural entrepreneurship, and he's always traveling to places in Southeast Asia to try mm -hmm. to start companies up. And I imagine the same thing happens with uh, you know uh, capital concentrations in Australia, New Zealand, but of course I think China, as you said, is is the, uh, the big the big kid on the block, and they would be interested in infrastructure and business of all kinds. And it, it takes me to whether the United States, not Singapore, not Australia, not China, and not New Zealand, um, has a presence in terms of business to build up business, to you know deal with that disparity you mentioned, to bring tourism in, uh, to bring capital in uh, to, uh, to Southeast Asia. Is it happening? Can it happen more? How do we make it happen more? Uh, certainly, the United States is not a main player in in, in Southeast Asia in general. I mean, the, the tourism industry is driven by China, Korea, Japan, Europe, and probably fifth place, the United States. You know, even, even Australia. In fact, now that I think about it, Australia, you know, if you go around Southeast Asia, you see way more Australians than you do Americans. And so I would be surprised America may be even after Australia in terms of, of tourism in Southeast Asia. And I don't see I don't see a lot of uh, a lot of incentive for the Americans to get more involved because they the, the Southeast Asian countries really cater to those tourists. They cater to the Chinese, to the to the Japanese in the past and Koreans today. And and certainly, like I say, there's a lot of Australians that, that travel to Southeast Asia and spend their vacation time in, in Southeast Asia. And the Americans, it's just never been a real attractive area for Americans to go, uh, if it's because of the lack of infrastructure or the lack of the lack of advertisement or, or what, but there just aren't a lot of American tourists in that area. But tourism is, is alive and well. I mean, you've got uh, Angkor Wat and, uh, uh, you know, other, other historic sites in, in Southeast, in mainland Southeast Asia that, uh, are, are big tourist destinations for, for other Asians. Yeah. Um, you know, we talk about, in our shows, Carl, we talk about um, the glory days of the um, Peace Corps, back when, back when. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's interesting. You find people that you like, and lo and behold, you find that they were in the Peace Corps years and decades and generations ago. Yeah. And and they're enlightened because of that experience. And so it's citizen diplomacy, which is, you know, what you do. And um, I think there's a tremendous benefit to them and to us for having launched them into, you know, these uh, developing countries over the years. Um, I don't think it's safe uh, to go to Eastern Europe for somebody who wanted to have that experience right now. I don't think it's safe uh, for that matter to go to the Middle East. It hasn't been safe in most places in the Middle East for a long time. But query, you know, is it safe? So this is out of the marathon, man. Is it safe, Carl, <laughs> to go to go to you know Southeast Asia and go you know with a backpack to go as a citizen diplomat to go as a an ersatz Peace Corps member and relate to the people and you know exchange ideas and views and food. And all that, and 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 do soft power at the citizen level. Is that something we should be doing? Will that benefit the United States? Uh, will it, you know, connect us better? Well, sure, it will. I mean, any any time you engage on people to people uh, relations, I think it 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 helps. Uh, you know, in some ways, Southeast Asia, some of the some of the bigger countries have kind of moved past the Peace Corps uh, sort of mindset. Uh, you know, when I, I when I look at at Malaysia, uh, Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam, I, I don't think that those countries would be particularly receptive to that, and even Indonesia probably wouldn't be very receptive to that. 
but certainly it's it's safe to to go in. I mean, there's there's no there's not a lot of animosity I, as long as you don't try to introduce religion. You know, I mean, religion re, the religious aspect becomes problematic in almost all those countries because of because of the dominant religion in the in the region. Uh, in, in in the particular country, I think that, that then it becomes problematic. But certainly, the Peace Corps is is something that is acceptable. I don't know that there is a big Peace Corps presence in in any of those countries anymore. Uh, Asia Foundation has has operations that that work in all the countries. I, I've certainly been to all the countries and have never felt threatened in any way. Uh, uh, maybe maybe Myanmar has changed since I was there last. Uh, I was I was last in Myanmar in 2019, and uh, you know now that now that the junta is there, it probably isn't a great place to to go visit. But prior to that, I mean, it's always remarkable to me the extent to which the dollar is accepted in many of the countries, including Cambodia. The dollar is the prominent currency. I mean, it, the people in Cambodia themselves use use the dollar, and everybody speaks English. You know, you, you're never going to find being there where someone doesn't speak English. So, you know, so it's it's westernized in that sense. And it's very comfortable for a for a Western tourist like me to go and 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 not have too much trouble getting around in, in any one of the countries, including Laos. Uh, you know, that, that even though it's it's small and it doesn't really have a lot of interaction with the United States, there's there's a there's fair fairly widespread use of the dollar and and of uh, the english language so it's 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 yeah i mean there's there's certainly opportunity for for people to people kinds of exchanges but i i, I don't think that it's particularly uh prevalent that that we do any peace corps operations in those areas anymore but mostly mostly uh development related initiatives i think mm. You know, you mentioned religion, and it, it strikes me that uh, um, at least Malaysia, maybe other places in Southeast Asia, are predominantly Islam, Islamic. Um, Indonesia is the middle. largest, the largest Islamic population in the world. Okay, so yeah. Malaysia and Indonesia, and you know, if you go there and you you know just walk down the street, um, they don't look like uh, you know Arabs from the Middle East or Central Asia. They, they don't look like them. They don't talk like them or behave like them, but I, I can't tell. I'm just a, a visitor. And so my question to you is, are they politically aligned with what happens in the Middle East, what happens with uh, Islamic organizations in the Middle East, what's happening now? Well, well sure. I mean, you know, Indonesia didn't recognize Israel. And I'm not sure they do today. That uh, I don't think, I don't think if you're flying from it, I don't think you can fly uh, uh, Israeli airplane into Indonesia. That there's there's limits on what they do, and certainly there's there's an alignment with the Palestinians, uh, with what's happening today in in Gaza, in both Malaysia and and Indonesia. But yeah, there's not there's not a uh, there's there certainly is extreme extremism in in Indonesia. There's there's a fair fair amount of, of uh, Islamic terrorism in, in Indonesia, but it's mostly in the rural areas. It's not really in in the in the cities. You certainly is. It's a very very open open society where you have you have some some very devout uh, Muslims and some who are much more much more uh, cosmopolitan in their view. Okay, last question, Carl, because um, we're really running out of time, and that is um, looking at it from you know the Department of State point of view. Um, from Tony Blinken's point of view, from um, Joe Biden's, you know, worldview point of view, uh, how important is Southeast Asia? Um, is it as important as Europe or Africa or Latin America? Um, and what kind of, um, you know, what kind of attitude should we, the United States, have overarching um, view of of the relevance, the importance of that region? in our uh, diplomatic relations? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a tough question to answer in a few words. I mean, I think Southeast Asia is terribly, terribly important. It, it, it is the, the area where China and the United States compete directly, most directly. 
I think maybe maybe Central Asia is a little different, but I think Southeast Asia is where the real competition between the United States and China is today. Because again, you know, the old the old relationship, the United States provides the security guarantee, but China is the economic engine. And that's the that's the dynamic that continues in Southeast Asia. And that's an important dynamic. And and somehow the United States needs to figure out how to accommodate that Chinese activity and and not supplant it, but complement in a way that Southeast Asians maintain the relationship, the economic relationship with the United States. And that's where we've struggled, I think. You know, I think, you know, there, there were opportunities uh, for the United States to be much more economically engaged in the past, and we've sort of muffed those chances. Uh, I don't think IPEF is going to do that. And so, what, what we really need is a good, strong economic relationship with Southeast Asia to sustain what we have, because the security relationship in and of itself isn't going to work. The Chinese are going to supplant the United States in terms of the security relationship if we're not careful. We can maintain you know, the freedom of the seas and, and those sort of very national interests of the United States, but maintaining that broader security relationship with Southeast Asia. We're going to have to figure out how to integrate ourselves and integrate Southeast Asia's economy into the economic relationship of the United States. And we do that by, by encouraging uh, friend shoring, call it what you want, supply chain resilience with the countries in Southeast Asia. And I think that that, that is what is going to be our success. And we have to do that in conjunction with Japan and Australia because they are a much better partner in the eyes of the Southeast Asians than we are, because first, first we're further away, and second, we're, we're too focused on the military component, and that is not going to work in Southeast Asia, because they want to maintain the relationship. They want to be friends with everybody and take advantage of that friendship. Thank you, Carl. It's so important that we make people aware of these things so that Southeast Asia doesn't fall off the side. Uh, we should all be aware of the importance of our connection with all those countries. Carl Baker, Senior Advisor, Pacific Forum. Thank you so much. Thank you. Aloha. show, why don't you give us a like or subscribe to our channel. Thanks so much.